Well, I think that that's changed to some extent. I think part of the tattoo community, as I wrote about it in the 90s when I was doing my research, um, it was uh, partly a function of the um, sort of the Senate, you know, um, um, the whitewashing of tattooing and the, um, you know, the mainstreaming of tattooing and um, bringing it into the middle class. Um, and so the, the tattoo community um, sort of formed around the, the formation of those tattoo conventions that you talked about attending, um, which at that time were really growing. Um, uh, at that time, the uh, American Tattoo, uh, or the National Tattoo Association dominated um, the tattoo convention still. Um, and um, that is no longer the case. Um, there are tattoo conventions everywhere all the time they are small and they're huge and they're you know um, they're just the scene is so different from it was you know in the mid to early 90s when i was first doing my work so the tattoo community i think has has changed and even the notion of community has really changed i think the, a lot of the what are now the old timers back then those old timers a lot of them are dead um, um so what now are the old timers i think some of them still might um, you know, have some sense of the community anymore, but I think for the younger people who are involved in the movement, I think that is just gone. I think a lot of it is gone. I think where you find community now probably is in the more, um, I hate to use the more, the term extreme, but the more, um, you know, extreme elements of the movement, which is the, um, you know, the hardcore body modification, you know, folks. You know, and even that, a lot of that has crept not just into the mainstream tattoo, community or whatever you want to call it now, uh, but into mainstream society, of course, you know, because as mainstream, as tattoos become more mainstream, then what is extreme has to become more extreme. Um, and and you're always going to find a community of people who take a sense of um, solace in each other and in their shared activities and find that sort of spiritual sense in their activities. But as more and more of those activities become um, pulled into the mainstream and just become fashion, um, you know, there's less for them to choose from. And so then they have to engage in more hardcore activities you know, to, to have a sense of identity for themselves, I think. Um, I think that that's still um, the case. Obviously, the, um, you know, the fine artists are dominating more and more of the field. And I shouldn't say the fine artists, but at least people, tattooists who represent themselves, you know, as fine artists. Um, and certainly it's becoming more and more normative for, um, um, for, we, for us to expect that you know, um, and to not expect to go into a tattoo shop and to, to um, find bikers anymore. Although, obviously, that's still the case. You certainly can still find that. You, you can find that all over the world today. Um, but I think the media is still um, using that same narrative. I think that because I still read these articles, because I'm still in these articles, um, where they still open their stories in the same way. Um, even if they're going to talk about a fine art show in Paris, they still, I think, fall back on those same um, um, old uh, phrases, which is, you're not going to find sailors here. And then they go on and then talk about, you know, what's going on today. Um, I think it's going to be a while, I guess, until we move away from um, uh, the, that, that, that old style discussion of that because I think we're still, you know, because we still have um, enough people alive today who remember when tattooing was dominated by working class people. Um, and again, there are still plenty of working class people who still clearly wear tattoos and who, you know, clearly still give tattoos. So the field is, is clearly not um, one dimensional. I mean, it is still um, full of a lot of different things. Um, um, and people are not quite fully ready to accept um, that it is completely mainstream and completely middle class. Well, they have. I mean, they, they have. The fact that we've got um, uh, models who are, you know, high fashion models who can, you know, wear their tattoos openly and not just small tattoos, but large tattoos um, openly. I mean, part of that, of course, is shock value. You know, part of that is, is you know, um, 
uh, designers um, and you know and modeling agencies and, and, and marketers being edgy and part of that is because we are used to it and we are you know used to seeing it um, um, it is we have changed our attitudes but we haven't changed them fully yet I mean we really are talking about a change that has happened within the last um, 30 years and that's not a huge amount of time um, to completely change you know social attitudes you know it's about the same amount of time that we've seen um, the women's movement the gay and lesbian movement which is only now if we want to compare it to the gay and lesbian movement which is only now really getting traction you know in terms of things like you know marriage equality and that kind of thing um, so it's a, again, it's a relatively new movement. It's newer than the civil rights movement. Not that I'm trying to compare it, you know, to something major like that, but it's a new, you know, it's new, relatively speaking. Um, I think the men's movement, not so much so. I think, again, that was that was part of that uh, the change, you know, in the movement. But I think for, the, for women, it's still absolutely a case. I think a lot of women continue to use tattoos, um, especially women that wear larger tattoos and women that wear tattoos on more um, um, visible areas of their bodies. Um, I think it, I think a lot of women are doing it in a way that they're reclaiming their bodies because as much as things... Um, um, you know, just talk about the women's movement. I mean, the women's movement, again, is relatively the same age as what we're talking about. And we still live in a time in which um, women are raped and women are um, beaten and women are slut shamed. Um, and um, so there's a lot of things that have not changed for women. And so women's bodies in particular are largely not of their own property. And so I think tattoos still operate as something that women can do to make them their own in some ways. You know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing to do because um, there's still a lot of ways in which um, tattoos are a way to beautify the female body and, you know, and have been since women have begun getting tattooed. But a lot of women are not doing that and are doing something, you know, much more radical with their tattoos. And so I think that's still very much the case today. Um, when I wrote it in the early 90s, I think it's still the case today for a lot of women. Um, I mean, it, it clearly all has. I mean, it certainly all has. The fact that there are so many more um, designs and art forms to choose from, and certainly I talk about that in my book, the fact that um, um, it wasn't the American, traditional American biker or sailor design that, that brought, you know, middle class in middle class people into tattooing, it was the non-Western design, you know, that brought people into tattooing because it had, you know, a different aesthetic, a different use of the body. It was seen as more artistic because it was more exotic, you know. Um, it was it was the fine art people who, you know, were attracted to that, both in the artists as well as in the clientele. Um, and I think that's still the case today, although, of course, you know, we have this new, um, not new, it's been around now for quite some time, but, um, you know, the, um, the people who are very interested in um, the resurgence in, you know, the Americana style, all of the new, you know, retro um, types of tattooing, but, you know, with all the twists, um, um, you know, that, that, that is so much more interesting now to a younger generation. But we're talking also about younger people who didn't grow up um, in a time where they saw um, biker tattooing and sailor tattooing as the dominant type of tattooing in the West. And so they're now exposed to all of these different forms of tattooing and in some ways don't have that context. And so in some ways it's just a big candy shop for them of tattoo styles that are largely stripped of context. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, the younger generations today, you know, Y and X, not even X anymore, Y and Z, whatever we're looking at today, um, it's a very different world that they have to choose from, both in terms of design, designs and in terms of discourse. Um, they're, they're not living in a world where, sure, they have to tell their parents about their tattoo, and that's, you know, always a bit of a negotiation, but they themselves aren't... Um, making decisions based on um, a connection between a different a design and a culture or a design and a stigma. Um, they're just picking designs. Yeah, 
Well, sure. Um, you know, and, and the interesting thing is, is, is there's still a little bit of a feedback, too. Um, um, you know, for a while there, the, the reason that we have one of the most popular styles today, which is the black and gray style of tattooing, um, is because it, the, the couple of the earliest artists who pioneered that style came out of prison. And so they brought that style out with them, and their clientele wanted it. And because they didn't have the tools on the outside to do it, because the tools were available on the inside, they had to then modify the modern tattoo machine to mimic you know, the way that the tattoo machines on the inside worked anyway. And they created this new style, which, of course, is, allows us now to do so much more beautiful and, and detailed work than was possible with the early machines with their multiple needles. Um, um, and there's still a little bit of a back and forth. You know, you've got middle class guys walking around with a loca. You know what I mean? On their chest or on their back. I mean, where did that come from? That came from the gangs. So you have still this, um, you know, this cannibalization, can, uh, you know, we're, we're cannibalizing, you know, styles that come from a place that's so different. Um, um, from us, you know, from the prisons and from the streets, just like we did from Polynesia and just like we did from Japan. And, you know, we're still doing that a little bit, but that doesn't mean that those styles are still there. Now, you know, of course, ironically, a lot of the styles in Polynesia did disappear, although, you know, again, we do have a resurgence, thankfully. You know, there are artists there that are bringing it back, um, but it never, ever went away in our prison system. Uh, just like it did in, did in prison systems around the world. It's again, there's a reason that it's been there since the Romans because it's super effective and it's not going to go away there. Um, it's just not something that is on our radar unless you watch a prison show, you know, TV show or movie or something like that. It's just not really on our radar. So that that part of it is always going to be a little bit kind of um, as, as, as mainstream and as whitewashed as I think tattoos are going to continue to get in our society, we're going to continue to see, because most of us don't go to prison, you know, although, well, here in the United States, a lot of us do, actually, let's just say, a lot of us do, um, but we are going to continue to see that um, on the edge, you know, of society, you know, cons and ex-cons who are wearing those tattoos. And there's something about that that kind of keeps, um, there's that tension, you know, between all the middle class people who are wearing their tattoos that they got in their, you know, nice shops and all of our cons and our ex-cons and our gang members and our ex-gang members wearing their tattoos. Um, I don't know. It's just there's something that's interesting about that because, again, um, um, as much as I think um, there might have been a not conscious but a sort of a semi-conscious desire to make those other styles of tattooing go away, that one's not going anywhere. That's an interesting question. The latest statistic that I saw, interestingly, the um, the largest group who was um, tattooed was not the youngest group, or the largest group who was getting tattooed. I'm trying to remember. It was the latest survey. It was in the United States, so it might not have been representative. But it was actually, you know, it was broken down by age group, and it was in the it's like in the 30s versus the 20s or the older group. And I thought that was interesting. Does that mean that younger people are not getting them as much? Anyway, so I'm not sure about that. I thought that was sort of an interesting one because, you know, we expect to constantly see young people get more and more and more. And instead, it was that little mid-age um, group. Anyway, um, to your question, do we ever expect to see um, people without tattoos being in the minority? I don't know. That's an interesting question. I will say that um, my husband is um, not tattooed, and for years when we would meet people, instead of it being, or I should say in more recent years, instead of it being, um, why are you tattooed to me, it was why are you not tattooed to him, um, which is sort of interesting. Like, he was the odd, odd one. I don't know. That's how I'll answer that. I don't know. <laughs>